If you can, cast your mind back a few months. Can you remember a time when toilet roll wasn't a prized possession, or when going out meant more than a trip to the supermarket? You may recall talk of another crisis, one that threatened millions of lives and livelihoods. In the midst of the coronavirus pandemic, this episode turns its attention back to this other threat to our world, climate change. One of the few positives to emerge from the pandemic is a dramatic decline in greenhouse gas emissions. Both China and Europe are forecast to emit 25% less greenhouse gases in 2020. And in New York, carbon monoxide levels have already dropped by 50%. As city smogs lift, fewer people are predicted to suffer strokes, contract heart disease or lung cancer. While this drop will only be temporary, does the pandemic point to how bold action on climate change is possible? Or is it inevitable that hundreds of millions of people will face hunger, drought and flooding? In this episode of LSEIQ, I explore the question, are we doomed or can the climate crisis be averted? And the extinction rate is up to 10,000 times faster than what is considered normal with up to 200 species becoming extinct every single day. Erosion of fertile topsoil. Deforestation of our great forests. Toxic air pollution. Loss of insects and wildlife. The acidification of our oceans. These are all disastrous trends being accelerated by a way of life that we, here in our financially fortunate part of the world, see as our right to simply carry on. While scientists have spoken for many years about the dangers of climate change, in recent years it's been youth activists, not scientists, policymakers or research, who have propelled the issue into the mainstream. And Greta Thunberg and her Fridays for Future strike isn't the first youth movement. In 1992, Severn Suzuki made an impassioned speech at the UN conference in Rio. Hello, I'm Severn Suzuki speaking for ECHO, the Environmental Children's Organization. We're a group of 12 and 13 year olds trying to make a difference. We've raised all the money to come here ourselves, to come 5,000 miles to tell you adults you must change your ways. In the UK, Extinction Rebellion, XR for short, have mounted high profile protests including shutting down of major roads and bridges in central London. But its conduct and ideology have been called into question. On the BBC's Andrew Neil show, one XR representative was accused of scaremongering. I've looked through the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the latest AR5. Most scientists don't agree with this. Climate change scientists, those who know there is a problem. I see no reference to billions of people going to die or children going to die in under 20 years. I mean, so there's a lot how would they die? Mass migration around the world is already taking place due to prolonged drought in countries, um, it, particularly in South Asia. There are wildfires in Indonesia, the Amazon rainforest, also Siberia, you know, the Arctic. The, 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 so these, are all, uh, these are all really important problems and they mm -hmm. can cause fatalities, mm -hmm. but they don't cause billions uh, of deaths. So. Is XR and its significant youth base affecting positive change or not? I spoke with one of its members, Ivan, who began by telling me what it was like to join. They are welcoming of everyone. Um, and so when you walk in there, it's very, yeah, it's sort of generous people. I was definitely thrust in the deep end a little bit. So we were talking about, um, I went to sort of a workshop on what affinity groups are, and affinity groups are the small groups within XR that carry out sort of the, the action. So they're the people that will, sort of, I don't know, the little groups that you'll see that will chain themselves to something. The whole, they had so many people in the room though, um, that you could barely hear what the speaker was saying. So I was sort of sitting there going, like, I have no idea what was going on. Absolutely no idea. And then the following week with the induction was how I properly was then, okay, everything, yeah, now everything is like what I actually think it is rather than sort of this hubbub of not really knowing what was going on. There are a huge range, there are people that have that are involved now that have never been involved in any sort of activism, um, especially the elderly generation. They are the people that are now saying to me, um, when we're on a bridge, we're on a roadblock, let me get arrested, you saw your future ahead of us. 
and they're saying they've never done anything like that and now they're the ones that are more than willing to get arrested um, you have them going on hunger strike. So we had, I think there's a group of five people went on a hunger strike outside the Conservatives um, offices during the election. And there's a reason why people are joining XR and going to these meetings is because they are worried and pessimistic about what's going to happen. But what is it that XR believe is the worst case scenario? I think when you sort of have um, the, sort of the, the ice sheets melting in sort of Greenland and um, Antarctica, um, when the sea levels can rise by two meters by sort of um, 2100, um, and the heat, the, the acidity in the ocean rises, um, places in the global south will be the worst affected. It's not, it's not going to be the UK or America that's going to be the worst affected, it's, it's the global south. And um, you'll see mass migration from these places into places like Europe and, and from south Europe moving up into the north and trying to get to the UK. Um, so massive economic disruption, um, we'll see food supplies beginning to disappear, um, water will no longer become sort of safe to drink, it will become toxic. Um, and I think there's sort of such a variety of awful sort of circumstances that I think will find us in this sort of, it sort of begs to belief. Um, you're already seeing the wildfires in Australia and people are sort of labeling it as sort of wildfires are a normal thing to happen. Well, like, yes, they are, but never to that extent. XR have staged a number of high-profile protests, not least in London. I don't think any other group has, in a long, long time, has blocked up the centre of London for two weeks. Really non-violent disruptive action that is the core principle, especially after the October rebellion. Um, and I don't think that went how we wanted it to go. Um, the media didn't report on it the way that we wanted them to. They really p picked up on certain stories like the Canning Town, um, tube station action. With other Extinction Rebellion members gluing themselves to trains, commuters couldn't understand why public transport had become the latest target. Altogether, three trains were halted by rooftop protests. People in XR were saying you shouldn't do that. There was a poll that went out on Telegram, which is how we get a lot of our, how we broadcast a lot of what we're doing during these sort of rebellions. And the poll was pretty overwhelmingly, you probably shouldn't do that. It's not a good idea because it felt like it was excluding the working class by focusing on that particular tube station. And I think that brought a lot of negativity around XR. And so the, the weeks following that was real sort of, I don't know if we're, what we're doing is right anymore, what we're doing is being effective. XR's ideology goes beyond purely an environmental focus. Ivan argues that confronting climate change involves wider social change. Because a lot about what XR is is more than just stopping climate change and the climate catastrophe. It's a lot more than that. It, it does look beyond um, the climate catastrophe. So they talk of regenerative culture, um, which is this sort of culture of sort of really caring for each other. And by caring for each other, we then care for the world. But there has been criticism of XR, that it's broadly a white and middle class movement. Isn't this a problem? I think really think the reason for that is because um, we have the ability to sacrifice our time um, and to do these things um, and I think that's why we don't I think that's why it's being criticised and why the most people you see involved are white and middle class is because we have the ability to sacrifice our time we have the ability to take a week off work um, I think there have been some of the founders of XR that have sort of been criticised for not taking seriously or just not taking the issue seriously enough because they only see environmental um, or the climate change as being the only issue whereas it is so climate change is an issue that relates to all groups and it can be shown that it is, yeah, it's, sort of, it's a feminist issue, it's a, it's a race issue, it's all of these different things. And I think that's how we need to look at climate change as not just being sort of this environmental issue, but the social issue as well. What are the next steps for XR? Are you looking for any kind of particular kind of outcomes? I think especially getting carbon emissions down to net zero, our aim was, is still 2025. Um, but the UK government has still not moved away from its 2050 date. And I find it very annoying when Boris Johnson not announces that oh, we're banning the uh, sale of diesel and petrol cars in 2035 and by 2040, and it's sort of like glorifying himself by saying we're banning this, and it's just, it's nowhere near enough. Nowhere near enough, which, yeah. Do you think that there is a date of no return if we move? I think 2030 is supposed to be the date if we... If we don't limit it to, I think it's like one and a half degrees, um, by that point, 
then we reach the tipping point and then it just becomes sort of a landslide. To what extent should we be encouraging individuals to make changes in their life? I think we definitely have to encourage individuals to make the change now because it will eventually get to the point where they have to make these changes and reducing meat consumption I think is really important. You don't have to go vegan, you don't have to go vegetarian, but reducing your meat consumption is definitely a very important thing. Um, reducing flying is sort of one long haul flight can make up the same amount, same amount of carbon emissions as your household. And so I think reducing flying is a massively important thing. I do know some people that are not gonna have kids because of the climate change, um, which, is I think it's it's sad that it's now come to that where people don't want to have kids because of climate change. And I find it very sad that people are now saying I don't want to have children because I'm, I don't want them to suffer in the future. But I think it's more important that we need to make a system change rather than sort of an individual change. And I'm just wondering yeah. how you go about, or if you go about trying to persuade friends and family about the kind of benefits of the movement and climate change? Yeah, I think I think they struggle to sort of understand why I'd be willing to get arrested and stuff like that. Um, and I think speaking to my mum, I find it quite difficult at points because I'd be saying, well, can you reduce your meat consumption? Can you do this? Can you do that? And she's going like, well, I don't have time for that. I don't have time for that. And I find that very difficult to sort of deal with. I find it my dad's actually been quite receptive. He sort of signed up to sort of Greenpeace, which is very surprising. He's sort of like a my sort of right wing father, and I'm sort of like joining Greenpeace, and I'm like, what is going on? So there have been changes like that where I've been like, wow, I, I think I am having effects on the family, um, but I feel like they're sort of very still not listening to everything that's going on and not fully realizing the what's coming, which makes me worried because I don't think they are listening to me enough. Some people around me, especially more my friends than my family are taking steps to combat their sort of individual emissions. Bob Ward is the Policy and Communications Director of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at LSE. I began by asking him about the benefits of declaring a climate emergency. A lot of people describe this as an emergency, but it's a it's a different kind of emergency. Most people, when they experience an emergency, it means you immediately drop everything and deal with the emergency. Your house being on fire, that's emergency. You do everything. You drop everything and get on with that. But with climate change, we've got to tackle greenhouse gas emissions whilst also continuing to live and raise living standards uh, we can't just stop everything. People here, in fact, I met with a group of students uh, earlier in the week who were uh, wanting to organise a debate about a climate emergency. And I said, well, look, I'm not sure that that's the most productive way, you know. And I, I told them my reservation. I said the the most difficult problem we face is 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 trying to move the discussion to engage people who are vaguely aware, but this isn't the primary issue for them, and you've got to engage them in the discussion about us all moving together. On the other side of the argument, Bob also contends with climate change deniers. I, I'm spending less of my time, although I, it's still present, in particular there are parts of the UK media which continue to promote the voices of those who uh, reject the science, in my view, with great irresponsibility in doing that. Um, and but we're now having more conversation about what we should do about climate change rather than does it exist. I also think that uh, people are just generally seeing things around them happening now. I'm interested in this idea of the cliff edge. If we don't do anything by 2030, for example, we're basically screwed. Have we already passed certain thresholds, which means the world is going to change and we're just going to have to react to that. So uh, there is some confusion and misinformation about kind of critical thresholds that we face, but there are critical thresholds. And so let me try and explain what some of these are. Um, let's talk about thresholds in the climate system, which lead to huge potential risks. An example of that would be if you get destabilization of the major land-based ice sheets in Greenland and West Antarctica. Between them, those two ice sheets contain enough ice that if it goes into the uh, oceans, would raise global sea levels by 13 meters. Now, we don't think that will happen, would happen very rapidly, but we do think there might be a point where 
uh, the destabilization becomes unstoppable. And there are some scientists who think we may already have passed that point in parts of West Antarctica and in Greenland where they are seeing the collapse of ice shells which hold back the glaciers and it's going to be unstoppable. Why 2050 then and not before? We've just had an election in which uh, I think 2030 and 2035 were banded around. Why should we not be more ambitious or should we? Well, the government uh, brought forward legislation to set a target of reaching net zero emissions by 2050 after receiving the expert advice of the Committee on Climate Change. This is a group of independent experts who are uh, part of a statutory committee that advises parliament and government. And they had a look at the task of getting the UK to net zero and decided that the earliest you could reasonably think you could, we could do this is going to be 2050. It assumes many things about technological progress, but also about behavior change. And so when people say, oh, well, we can do it, you know, within the next five or 10 years, I just look at what we have to do and you say that's it's just not realistic. So let me give an example. Um, one of the major sources of emissions in most households is gas central heating. So 23 million homes across Britain have gas central heating. You will have to replace all of that heating, not just tear it out, but you've got to replace it with an alternative. And if you say you're going to do that within the next five years, I just don't know how you're going to do it partly because we don't really know how we're going to replace it. Uh, in larger homes, you can use things called um, heat pumps, which rely on extracting heat, latent heat in the ground or in the air, but that's not suitable very much for apartment blocks, etc. And if you rip out central heating without replacing it, you put in danger a lot of people who would then suffer during the winter and we would see people die. So it's it's a very serious issue. And if anybody says to me, OK, why don't we do it by 2025? And say, well, tell me how we're going to do it on heating. And I haven't had anybody come forward and tell me how we can do this. It's good to have ambition, but we have to be clear that we know how to do it. So what needs to be done when? To get to net zero by 2050 probably means you have to have cut emissions by about half by 2030. And so when people say we've got 10 years to stop climate change, that's what they're referring to. If we're not out at an about half of emissions, the current plans, the national pledges, would mean that emissions are the same in 2030, about the same in 2030 as today. And that's clearly not on the, the right path. So in terms of what we should do then, uh, one of the major kind of institutional um, things that currently exist today is the COP. Can you just describe what that is? And I know that the UK is going to be hosting the next one and the significance of that. It's worth noting here that since the recording, the COP, or the Conference of the Parties of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, has been postponed to 2021. Well, the uh, countries of the world signed a major treaty on climate change back in 1992 called the uh, United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. A fundamental review of existing environmental policies is now underway in my country so that we may be able to deal with global environmental issues more effectively and to take a lead in creating an environmentally sound society. And all the countries that were part of that treaty meet regularly on an annual basis in different countries. And the UK um, volunteered to host uh, the one that's taking place in 2020. And it's particularly crucial because five years ago, when countries gathered in Paris, they signed another strong agreement on climate change. They set a very clear um, objective of limiting uh, global warming to well below two degrees Celsius. Good afternoon, everybody. Today is a historic day in the fight to protect our planet for future generations. 10 months ago in Paris, I said, before the world that we needed a strong global agreement 
to reduce carbon pollution and to set the world on a low carbon course. The result was the Paris Agreement. Last month, the United States and China, the world's two largest economies and largest emitters, formally joined that agreement together. And the treaty, the Paris Agreement, says that those countries have to come forward five years on from, the, from Paris with um, revised pledges that should be stronger. And that's all due to happen in 2020 ahead of the summit. It's going to be extremely challenging this summit in Glasgow for a number of reasons. Uh, one of the reasons is that Donald Trump is withdrawing the United States from the treaty in the United States as the world's second biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. Uh, China, the world's biggest emitter, is worrying about growth slowing. Uh, and there are those calling within China that it should reboost, it should be boosting growth through uh, burning more coal. And then there are challenges that the UK has made for itself. Brexit means that um, the government will be obviously occupied with dealing with that. All in all, then, the signs aren't wholly positive for the COP. But can we be more optimistic that individuals, communities and organisations are beginning to take climate change more seriously? There's a recognition that we probably won't be able to reach true zero and we will end up having to compensate for some sort of residual emissions by extracting greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. One way you can do that, of course, is by planting trees, uh, which take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, but there are also uh, artificial ways such as you know, using artificial filters that take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and then you store it underground or in other places. People are changing their habits all the time. Uh, let me give you an example with um, meat consumption, which you mentioned. So meat consumption, livestock creates methane when it belches. It's a powerful greenhouse gas, so we want to try and reduce those emissions. There are things you can do to try and reduce the amount of methane that livestock produce by changing their diet. There might be things we can do in terms of genetic engineering of livestock. Uh, but we also see consumers are already changing in Britain and are eating less meat, not for environmental reasons necessarily, but also because of animal welfare concerns or indeed health concerns. And what about travel? We are rapidly changing in the UK or putting in place plans to move to electric vehicles. Now, if people drove electric vehicles instead of petrol-driven vehicles, it would have multiple benefits. Not only would it reduce the greenhouse gases, the carbon dioxide that's produced when you um, uh, have a car driven by the internal combustion engine, but you will also decrease uh, local air pollution. More than 40,000 people a year die early because of air pollution in the UK, so you would reduce that. And if you also combine with electric vehicles a better plan for transport around cities like London, so that you're also reducing congestion, that would generally improve people's lives. Imagine being able to travel around London and cut your, your travel time in half. LSE is an interesting case study. What is it doing to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions? The secret for LSE, as with it, the rest of the country, is it has got to get its, ze its emissions down to net zero by 2050. And that's not just by reducing emissions from electricity. LSE already has entirely green electricity, no emissions involved in electricity. But it doesn't know how it's it can heat its buildings without creating emissions. And then on top of that are all the other activities that the students and staff undertake here, including travel. It is right that we have a range of ways in which we can engage more with the outside world, particularly at a time of Brexit, when there's concerns about Britain looking, becoming more inward-looking. LSE is a global university. That It's about engagement with the, with the rest of the world. But flying clearly is a major carbon emitter. Isn't it best just to eliminate it entirely? Well, when people talk about banning flying or stopping people from flying, they usually are not taking into account any of the benefits of flying. And the world has benefited, I think, from people being able to move around more freely, experiencing firsthand different cultures. Many developing countries are 
currently trying to move their economies away from resource exploitation towards things like ecotourism. You have to be very careful. The ban on flying is not really about the emissions, it's about stopping people from traveling long distances. In the United States, for instance, um, the carbon intensity of flying is roughly the same as traveling by any other form of transport. They're all, most of their trains operate on diesel. As an optimist, I try to take comfort from the fact that we are starting to recognise the imminent challenges we face. The technological revolution promises us ways of making our lives more eco-friendly. But Bob is less convinced. Human civilization formed mainly in the last 12,000 years since the end of the last ice age. During that time, the climate's been relatively stable. Humans, modern human species, Homo sapiens sapiens, only evolved less than 250,000 years ago. So we have no evolutionary experience of, of such a climate. So anybody who tells me, oh, we're all geniuses and we'll adapt, I mean, that's a huge punt in the dark. And we're already seeing changes around the world that are proving how difficult it is to deal with those. And that's just the start. Svenja Siminski is head of adaptation research at the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment at LSE. Her work considers not how we can avoid climate change, but how we should respond to its impacts. My work focuses on adaptation to climate change, which, um, if you want to de describe the term, focuses on the impact of climate change. So what can we do to deal with the impacts of climate change? How can we be better prepared, more resilient, deal with disasters, deal with sea level rise. Even if we would be 100% successful and would stop emitting tomorrow, there is already enough um, change in the system, if you like, that we're already experiencing changing weather conditions, changing climate trends. Um, and that requires a response, that requires management, risk management, a little bit like what we're doing um, when we're dealing with disasters, so natural disasters. How can we be better prepared for that? And how can we then adjust like business processes, where people live, how people live? Interestingly, in the very beginning of the climate change discourse, um, some people were actually quite critical about adaptation, saying, oh, this is a defeat, admission of defeat. If you do adaptation, you've already sort of given up on mitigation. And I always say, look, at the end of the day, the best way to adapt is to mitigate. So, you know, the best way for society, for individuals, for businesses is to really, you know, deal with the cause of the problem. But at the same time, we just can't be complacent. And we really need also to get our act together to be prepared and, and also to assist those who are already experiencing changing climate conditions. Svenja's work identifies three aspects of how we can respond to climate change. Adaptation, mitigation and loss. Adaptation focuses on how we can proactively prepare for climate change, while mitigation focuses on how we can reduce its negative impacts. The third, loss, examines how we can cope with the inevitable destruction of parts of the environment. You know, there are certain changes in the system that um, that we can term as a loss, as a climate-induced loss. And um, some of that we can't recover. Some of that, if it's economic, financially, then it's a question of compensation, paying for it. So this has now become a, um, yeah, quite important, but also very controversial element of the climate negotiations, because it's also about fairness, justice, like who to blame for it. Interestingly, I used to work in the insurance industry and that, that was kind of my starting point, actually, this whole issue around disasters and, and the role of, um, we call it risk financing, so financial tools that help us to have finance in, in case a disaster happens. So I've been quite interested in how we can use these financial mechanisms to also make sure that we are better prepared and starting to plan and starting to send the right incentives. With this bleak outlook, how do we motivate society into action? Svenja's work also looks at the impact that narratives can play. 
for me, it's really important to get the narratives right. And that's also a big part of my work, actually, to, to try and help policymakers, individuals, cities, businesses. I mean, those are the sort of stakeholders that we do a lot of work with to help them find the right narratives in the face of climate change. I'm interested that you mentioned narratives because it seems to me that so often the narrative seems to be around climate change of we've got to sacrifice a huge amount and there seems to be a lack of a of a positive vision of a life where society is dealing with climate change positively. At the end of the day, people also need a vision. You know, where are we heading? How is this going to look like? Where are you know, the opportunities for us, what are we going to do? If we really want to tackle this problem, we need to to integrate climate change into how we plan our future and where we build, how we build, what people actually want in terms of their communities. Narratives, then, are a key aspect of how we perceive climate change. It could, for example, be regarded as a story of inevitable suffering and even moral failure. The film First Reformed, which depicts a priest's growing concerns about the environment, explores the link between religious judgment and global warming. May I ask a question? Yeah, go ahead. Will God forgive us? Will God forgive us for what we're doing to his creation? That's what Mansana asked me when I visited him. There's, there's been a lot of loose talk about environmental change. There's scientific consensus, 97%. It's a complicated subject. Not really. I mean, who benefits? Qui bono? Who profits? That's what I keep asking myself, besides the biblical call to stewardship. Who profits when we soil our own nest? As Mike Holm from the University of Cambridge writes in his work on climate change, other powerful narratives are at play. He argues XR is demanding fundamental changes to our everyday lives that resurrect the national myth of British war mobilisation and solidarity of the 1940s while the Green New Deal, an idea that's gained traction in the US, invokes Roosevelt's 1930s New Deal and its place in the national economic recovery. So what narratives should we be promoting? This, what we call just transition, I mean, that's kind of a term that picks up the fairness issues around um, moving away from, um, you know, from coal, for example. You know, what do you do with people who, li- who live and work in coal mines and are going to be significantly impacted by this? So what, what's the proposition there? What do you do? How can you support people there in terms of a fair transition? And that's an, that's an interesting um, and really important aspect. Are the people that are going to bear the consequences of climate change, the people that suffer the most, already the most vulnerable in our society? And how does that interact in terms of things like insurance and compensation? It is really important to realize that climate change is a kind of, well, it's a threat multiplier and it makes existing vulnerabilities actually much more pronounced. We really can't see climate change in isolation. It really needs to be in the context of all the other challenges that we are facing and, you know, social policy and inequalities and injustice, we're pretty bad at ensuring that new stuff that we are building, assets or houses, you know, factories, companies, infrastructure, that that's being done in a way that actually it's a resilient and doesn't just, you know, create bigger problems in in the future. The recent decision by the High Court to stop Heathrow Airport from building a third runway illustrates how we are struggling to integrate climate change with our other priorities. They described this as the most important environmental decision in a generation, and so it was no surprise they were cheering. There seems no way back for the expansion of London's main airport. The crucial part of the ruling was that the government was found to be in breach of its international climate change obligations. That not only means that Heathrow now won't happen, it also calls into question all sorts of other big infrastructure projects. How well is the UK doing? Is it one of the leaders in terms of adaptation? And um, secondly, 
Does it have a particular responsibility, given that it was one of the first countries, if not the first country, to instigate the kind of industrial revolution? Do we have a particular debt and a responsibility? Well, to start with that last question, yes, is the answer. And I think that is well recognised. I mean, that's also part of the UN mechanism. I mean, that recognises... Um, historic obligations because of past emissions and also the need for developing countries to give them some space to basically catch up economically. So I think the system there um, allows for that. And um, I think there is clearly an, an ethical responsibility. I mean, our personal footprint is so much higher than the personal footprint of those who are most exposed to climate change. I think the UK has, well, right now has a huge opportunity to show international leadership. How do these national and international interventions relate to the choices we make in our personal lives? I mean, I've got four kids, so, you know, if I'm talking about this, you know, I'm conscious that, yes, A, they have a footprint, we need to reduce our footprint, but also what are their you know, aims and, and ambitions and what, what world are they going to live in? And it's an, it's an interesting area and it gets then also quite, quite personal to, to the extent that, you know, some people say, oh, look, you know, I'm not going to have any kids. And, you know, that's fine. But I think to find a kind of common ground is, is difficult. And I think we need to be a bit careful because we could also alienate quite a few people. Yeah, I think the sort of blaming thing and being questioning people's choices uh, you know that's always difficult so should we be hopeful what kind of future should we be aiming for here's Svenja first followed by Bob Ward you know we're good at talking about it but the action is really not that convincing you know that, that is worrying and that is frustrating and that is scary and I was visiting we have a project partner in India and I was there with farmers and you know, that is dis discouraging because, you know, you can't really um, give them, you know, very sort of optimistic outlook because, I mean, they're already running out of water where they are. Well, I, I find in on climate change that being pessimistic leads to, you know, where does it lead you? If you're pessimistic, you don't do anything. I mean, you're just doomed. But I do think that there really is a question here. We, we can clearly, we could do this. We could stop global war, dangerous climate change and global warming, but only if there's the will there, the political will. And the thing about political will is that it, it does require policymakers to act and they act in re response to pressure from the public. So every one of us as individuals, the most important thing that any individual can do is to engage their national and local policymaker on this issue just telling them that you are concerned and you want to know what they think we should do is the most important way of getting action. It's more important than any changes you can make in your own life because what you've got to do is change the whole system. Tell us what you think using the hashtag LSEIQ. This episode of LSEIQ was produced by James Ruti with support from Natalie Abbott. Want to explore the issue of climate change in more depth? You can find more research about XR at rebellion.earth. The Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment has links to a large body of research, including adaptation research, sustainable development, growth and innovation, governance and legislation, and policy design and evaluation. Due to the coronavirus pandemic, our next episode will take a slightly different format. To bring you a new and insightful angle on the epidemic, we'll be making a shorter version of the podcast, LSE IQ Bites. In the first episode, we will be asking, what does gender have to do with pandemics? For more episodes of this podcast, and to subscribe, please visit lsc.ac.uk forward slash IQ, or search for LSE IQ in your favourite podcast app. And please consider leaving us a review, as this makes the podcast easier for new listeners to discover.